Ashton swung at her, and as he did, Kira's instincts took over. She imagined herself back in the training ground. As he swung, she dodged left and right, using her speed to her advantage. The soldier was big and strong, and he wielded a heavy sword. Yet she was light and unencumbered. And as he came down with a particularly fierce blow, meant to chop her in half, she sidestepped and left him off balance. She swung around with her staff and cracked him on the back of his wrist, and he dropped his sword, losing it in the snow. He looked back at her, shocked, then sneered and charged her with his bare hands, as if to tackle her. Kira waited, then at the last moment crouched low and brought the tip of her staff straight up, connecting with his chin. The blow snapped his neck back and sent him landing flat on his back, unmoving. Leo pounced on him and sank his fangs into his throat, making sure he was dead. Kira, assuming all her attackers were dead, was confused to hear movement behind her. She turned to see one of the two soldiers Leo had attacked, somehow back on his feet, limbing to his horse, drawing a sword from its saddle. The soldier rushed Leo, who still had his fangs in the other soldier's throat, his back to him. Kira's heart slammed in her chest. She was too far away to reach him in time. Leo, she cried out. But Leo, too busy snarling, did not realize. Kira knew she had to take drastic action or else watch Leo be killed before her eyes. Her bow was still in the snow, too far away from her. She thought quick. She raised her staff and broke it over her knee and it broke in two. She took one of its halves, its tip jagged, took aim, leaned back and hurled it like a spear. It whistled through the air and she prayed it find its target. Kira breathed with relief as she watched it pierce the soldier's throat right before he reached Leo. The man stumbled and fell at Leo's feet, dead. Kira stood there in the silence, breathing hard, seeing the carnage all around her. The five lords' men sprawled out in the snow, staining it red, and she could hardly believe what she had done. But before she could finish processing it, she suddenly detected motion out of the corner of her eye. She turned to see the squire, running for his horse. Wait, Kira called out. She knew she had to stop him. If he made it back to the Lord Governor, he would tell them what had happened. They would know it was she who had done this, and her father and her people would be killed. Kira picked up her bow, took aim and waited until she had a good shot. Finally, the boy broke into the clearing, and as the clouds opened and the moon shone down, she had her chance. But she could not take the shot. The boy had not done anything after all, and something within her just could not kill an innocent boy. Kira lowered her bow with shaking hands and watched him ride off, feeling sick, knowing it would be her death sentence. Surely a war would come for this. With the squire on the run, Kira knew her time was short. She should run back through the wood for her father's fort and alert them all as to what had happened. They would need time to prepare for war, to seal the fort, or to flee for their lives. She felt a terrible sense of guilt, yet also of duty. Yet Kira could go nowhere. Instead, she stood there and watched, mesmerized, as the dragon flapped its good wing and stared back at her. She felt she had to be by its side. Kira hiked quickly through the snow down the bank toward the gushing river until she stood before the dragon. It lifted its neck just a bit and stared at her, their eyes meeting, and the dragon stared back at her with an inscrutable expression. In its look, Kira thought she spotted gratitude, yet also fury. She did not understand. Kira stepped closer, Leo snarling beside her until she stood but a few feet away. Her breath caught in her throat. She could hardly believe she was standing so close to such a magnificent creature. She knew how dangerous this was, knew this dragon could kill her at any moment if it chose. Kira slowly lifted her hand, even as the dragon appeared to be frowning, and hard pounding with fear, reached out and touched its scales. Its skin was so rough, so thick, so primordial. It was like touching the beginning of time. Her hand trembled as her fingertips stroked it, and not from the cold. Its presence here was such a mystery, and her mind raced with a million questions. 
What hurt you? Kira asked, stroking its scales. What are you doing on this side of the world? There came a sound like a growling from deep within its throat, and Kira withdrew her hand, afraid. She could not read this beast, and even though she had just saved its life, Kira suddenly felt it was a very bad idea to be so close to it. The dragon looked at Kira and slowly raised a sharpened claw until it touched Kira's throat. Kira stood there, frozen, terrified, wondering whether it would slice her throat. Something flashed in its eyes and it seemed to change its mind. It withdrew its claw and then, to her surprise, in one quick motion, slashed down. Kira felt a searing pain on her face and she cried out as the claw grazed her cheek, drawing blood. It was just a scratch, but it was enough, Kira knew, to leave her with a scar. Kira reached up and touched the wound, saw the fresh blood in her hands, and felt a deep sense of betrayal and confusion. She looked back into the dragon's glowing yellow eyes, filled with defiance, and she was at a loss to understand this creature. Did it hate her? Had she made a mistake to save its life? Why had it only scratched her when it could have killed her? Who are you? She asked softly, afraid. She heard a voice, an ancient voice rumbling in her mind's eye. Theos. She was shocked. She was sure it was the dragon's voice. Kira waited, hoping it would tell her more. But then suddenly, without warning, Theos shattered the silence by shrieking, rearing its head and struggling to get away from her. It flopped and spun wildly, trying desperately to lift off. Kira could not understand why. Wait! Kira cried out. You are wounded. Let me help you. It pained her to see him flopping so much, blood dripping from its wound, unable to get one wing to work. He was so massive that each flop raised a great cloud of snow, shaking the ground, making the earth rumble and shattering the stillness of this snowy night. He tried so hard to lift off into the air, but could not. Where is it you want to go? Kira called out. Sios flopped again, and this time he rolled down the steep snowy bank, rolling again and again, out of control, unable to stop itself. He rolled right through the gushing rapids. Kira watched with horror, helpless, as the dragon splashed into the raging waters of the river below. No! she cried out, rushing forward. But there was nothing she could do. The great rapids carried Theos, flailing, screeching downriver, winding through the forest, around a bend and out of sight. Kira watched him disappear, and as she did, her heart broke inside her. She had sacrificed everything, her life, the destiny of her people to save this creature, and now she was gone. What had it all been for? Had any of it even been real? Kira turned and looked out and saw the five dead men, still lying in the snow. Saw Leo wounded beside her. She reached up and felt the sting on her cheek, saw the blood, and knew it had all been very real. She had survived an encounter with the dragon. She had killed five of the Lord's men. After tonight, she knew her life would never be the same again. Kira noticed the horse's trail winding into the wood, and she remembered the boy, riding to alert his people. She knew the Lord's men would be coming for her people. Kira turned and sprinted into the wood, Leo at her side, determined to make it back to Volus, to alert her father and all her people, if it were not already too late. Chapter 12 Vesuvius, king of the trolls and supreme leader of Marder, stood in the enormous cave beneath the earth, on a stone balcony a hundred feet high, and he looked down, surveying the work of his army of trolls beneath him. Thousands of trolls labored in this huge cavernous underground, hammering away at rock with pickaxes and hammers, chopping away at earth and stone the sound of mining heavy in the air. Endless torches lined the walls while streams of lava crisscrossed the floor, sparking, emitting a glow, 
brightening the cave and keeping it hot while trolls sweated and gasped in the heat below. Vesuvius smiled wide, his troll face grotesque, misshapen, twice the size of a human's, with two long fangs like tusks that emerged from his mouth, and beady red eyes which enjoyed watching people suffer. He wanted them, his people, to toil, to work harder than they'd ever had, for he knew it was only through extreme toil that he would achieve what his fathers could not. Twice the size of a typical troll, and three times the size of a human, Vesuvius was all muscle and rage, and he knew he was different, knew he could achieve what none before him had. He had hatched a plan that even his ancestors could not conceive, a plan that would bring glory to his nation forever. It would be the greatest tunnel ever created, a tunnel to bring them beneath the flames, all the way into Escalon. And with each fall of the hammer, the tunnel became just a little bit deeper. Not once in centuries had his people figured out how to cross the flames en masse. Individual trolls were able to pass through here and there, but most died on these suicide missions. What Vesuvius needed was an entire army of trolls to cross together at once, to destroy Escalon once and for all. His fathers could not understand how to do it, and they had become complacent, resigned to a life here in the wilds of Mara. But not he. He, Vesuvius, was wiser than all his fathers, tougher, more determined, and more ruthless. One day, while brooding, he had thought if he could not go through the flames or over them, then perhaps he could go under them. Captivated by the idea, he had set his plan into motion at once and had not stopped since, rallying thousands of his soldiers and slaves to build what would be the greatest creation of the Troll Kingdom, a tunnel beneath the flames. Vesuvius watched with satisfaction, as one of his taskmasters whipped a human slave, one they had captured from the West, chained to the hundreds of other slaves. The human cried out and fell, and he was lashed until he died. Vesuvius grinned, pleased to see the other humans work harder. His trolls were nearly twice the size of the humans, much more grotesque-looking too, with bulging muscles and misshaped faces, filled with a bloodlust that was insatiable. The humans he'd found were a good way for his people to vent their violence. Yet as he watched, Vesuvius was still frustrated. No matter how many people he enslaved, how many of his soldiers he put to work, no matter how hard he lashed them, how much he tortured or killed his own people to motivate them, the progress remained too slow. The rock was too high, the job too massive. At this rate, he knew they would never complete this tunnel in his life, and his dream of invading Escalon would remain but a dream. Of course, they had more than enough room here, but it was not room that Vesuvius had. He wanted to kill, to subjugate all humans, to take all that was theirs, just for the fun. He wanted it all. And he knew that if he was to get them, the time had come for more drastic measures. My lord and king, came a voice. Vesuvius turned to see several of his soldiers standing there, wearing the distinctive green armor of the troll nation, their insignia, a roaring boar's head with a dog in its mouth, emblazoned across the front. His men lowered their heads out of deference, looking to the ground as they had been trained to do in his presence. Vesuvius saw they were holding a troll soldier, wearing tattered armor, his face covered in dirt and ash and spotted with blood. You may address me, he commanded. Slowly, they raised their chins and looked in the eye. This one was captured in Sidemark, in Southwood, one report. He was caught returning from beyond the flames. Vesuvius looked over the captive soldier, shackled, and was filled with disgust. 
Every day he sent men west across on a mission to charge through the flames and emerge on the other side in Escalon. If they survived the journey, they were ordered to wreak terror among the many humans as they were. If they survived that, their orders were to seek out the two towers and steal the sword of fire, the mythical weapon that supposedly held up the flames. Most of his trolls never returned from the journey. They were either killed by the passage through the flames, or eventually by the humans in Escalon. It was a one-way mission. They were commanded never to return, unless they came back with the sword of fire in hand. But once in a while, some of his trolls seemed mostly disfigured from their journey through the flames, unsuccessful in their mission but seeking to return anyway, for safe harbor back in Mali. Vesuvius had no stomach for these trolls, whom he considered to be deserters. And what news do you bring from the way? he asked. Did you find the sword? he added, already knowing the answer. The soldier gulped, would be terrified. He slowly shook his head. No, my lord and king, he said, his voice broken. Vesuvius raged in silence. Then why did you return to Marda? He demanded. The troll kept his head low. I was ambushed by a party of humans, he said. I was lucky to escape and make it back here. But why did you come back? Vesuvius pressed. The soldier looked at him. Puzzled and nervous. Because my mission was over, my lord and king. Vesuvius assumed. Your mission was to find a sword or die trying. But I made it through the flames, he pleaded. I killed many humans and I made it back. And tell me, Vesuvius said kindly stepping forward and laying a hand on the troll's shoulder as he slowly walked with him toward the edge of the balcony. Did you really think, upon coming back, that I would let you live? Vesuvius suddenly grabbed the troll by the back of his shirt, stepped forward and hurled him over the edge. The soldier flailed, shrieking through the air as much as his shackles would allow. All the workers down below stopped and looked up, watching as he fell. He tumbled a hundred feet, and then landed with a splash on the hard rock below. The workers all looked up at Vesuvius, and he glared back down at them, knowing this would be a good reminder to all who failed. They quickly went back to work. Vesuvius, still in a rage and needing to let it out on someone, turned from the balcony and strutted down the winding stone steps carved into the canyon wall followed by his men. He wanted to see their progress himself, up close, and while he was down there, he figured he could find a pathetic slave to beat to a pump. Vesuvius wound his way down the steps, carved into the black rock, descending flight after flight, all the way down to the base of this vast cave, which became hotter the lower he went. Dozens of his soldiers fell in behind him as he strutted across the cave floor, weaving his way between the streams of lava, between hordes of workers. As he went, thousands of soldiers and slaves stopped working and parted ways, bowing their heads to the police. It was hot down there. The base heated not only from the sweat of men, but from the streaks of lava that crisscrossed the room sparks flying off the rocks as men struck them everywhere with axes and picks. Vesuvius marched across the vast cave floor, until finally he reached the entrance of the tunnel. He stood before it and stared, a hundred feet wide and fifty feet tall. The tunnel was being dug so that it sloped down gradually, deeper and deeper beneath the earth deep enough to be able to support an army when the time came to burrow under the flames. One day they would penetrate Escalon, rise above the surface, and take thousands of human slaves. 
it would, he knew, be the greatest day of his life. Vesuvius marched forward, snatched a whip from a soldier's hands, reached high and began lashing soldiers left. Reached high and began lashing soldiers left and right. They all went back to work, striking the rock twice as fast, smashing the hard black rock until clouds of dust filled the air. He then made his way to the human slaves, men and women they had abducted from Escalon and had managed to bring back. Those were the missions he relished most of all. Missions solely for the sake of terrorizing the West. Most humans died on the passage back, but enough survived, even if badly burned and maimed. And these he worked to make his tools. The Soviets zeroed in on the world. He thrust the whip into a human's hand and pointed at the woman. Kill her, he commanded. The human stood there, shaking, and nearly shook his head. Vesuvius snatched the whip back from his hand and instead lashed the man again and again until he finally stopped resisting. Dead. The others went back to work, averting his gaze, while Vesuvius threw down the whip, breathing hard and stared back into the mouth of the cave. It was like staring at his nemesis. It was a half-formed creation going nowhere. It was all happening too slowly. My lord and king, came a voice behind him. Vesuvius turned slowly to see several soldiers from the Mantra, his elite division of trolls, dressed in the black and green armor reserved for his best troops. They stood there, holding halberds in their sights. These were the few trolls Vesuvius respected, and seeing them made his heart quicken. It could only mean one thing. They had brought news. Vesuvius had dispatched the mantra on a mission many moons ago to find the giant that lurked in Great Wood, rumored to have killed thousands of trolls. 